Welcome to We the Kids. Hi, I'm Judy Frazier, president and founder of We the Kids. We the Kids puts God back into America's history. Listening to We the Kids radio show will inspire you and your kids to have a positive American identity, clear direction, and a powerful purpose for your life. Thank you for listening. Welcome to We The Kids Radio Show for kids from 8 to 108. I am Arch Hunter, a father, a husband, and an historian. And I'm Lydia Nuttall, a mom and executive board member for We The Kids and author of Forgotten American Stories, Celebrating America's Constitution. And later on in the show, we're going to hear from the We The Kids Liberty Players. The mission of We The Kids is to put God back into America's stories to help American kids be proud to be an American, to love and defend America's Constitution, and learn the principles of freedom that establish unprecedented freedom in our country so that they can preserve freedom in America. And that is so important. That's why we're doing this show. So we're glad you're listening. And today we have a very special program as we're going to celebrate Constitution Day, which is September 17th. And the first one was 1787. And we want to talk about what is the success formula of the United States Constitution. So today's Forgotten American Story is celebrating the Constitution Day. And what is the success formula of the United States Constitution? Lydia, what do we mean by successful formula? Well, it's interesting when I, was trying to wrap my head around the importance of our United States Constitution and what made it work. I kept thinking, okay, so I'm a mom. I love to cook. I'm in the kitchen and I'm always following recipes and noticing that when I, for instance, might add something not exactly according to what the recipe says, or I make a substitution for something that the recipe asked for, but I don't have it. So I think, well, maybe I'll substitute this ingredient for that ingredient that it doesn't work as well as what the recipe said. So I realized the constitution actually has a success formula or a recipe for its success. That um, With the success formula, that's what gives us the unprecedented amount of freedom and peace and prosperity that our country has been able to enjoy since we started our constitution form of government 233 years ago, to be exact, on September 17th. And we have to realize that when our founders wrote the Constitution. It was the first one that's ever liked that. So they're really putting things together that's never been formulated before. So share with our listeners, please, what are the steps in the formula that has made our Constitution and our country the success that it was and has been and is? So I came up with five ingredients, if you want to liken this to a recipe, or elements of the United States Constitution that make it work and have made our constitution is actually the oldest constitution from what I understand. No other written constitution has lasted as long as our United States constitution. And I think since 1789, the average lifespan of other nations' constitutions has been an average of 17 years. And I did find that France, when I started writing the Forgotten America Stories Celebrating America's Constitution, that France had at least 15 constitutions since it had its first written constitution in 1790 which was about four years after our constitution was written. So that's just kind of a side note, just interesting note. So one of the five ingredients or elements of our United States constitution that makes it work is 
sovereignty of the people. Arch, you want to elaborate on what you know sovereignty means? Well, first of all, sovereignty means supreme power or supreme authority. And in my world, Lydia, the three most important words in American history are the three first words of our preamble, which shows our sovereignty of the people. We, the people, and our founders had confidence in the average citizens of our country that we knew how and where and what type of government we should have. And Lydia, our founders were very aware of if we all put our power in a federal government, it would be abused. So the power of our government is in the sovereignty or the supreme rule or the supreme power of the people. I love that. There is definitely power in that because we, the people, can be checks and balances on the power of whoever is ruling over us. So in essence, what you're saying is whoever has the supreme power and authority to make and implement and enforce laws and settle disputes regarding the laws has sovereignty. So I love it because we, the people, as you mentioned, our preamble says, we, the people, give our government specific powers to accomplish the task of securing our unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the ability to pursue happiness. And that's what was stated in the Declaration of Independence. So and our founders realized that government to and of themselves would create a tremendous amount of power. So our founders, Lydia, believed that the only power our government should have is the power that we, the people, give it. Yes. And that's what's stated in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That means us. Yes. So it's not government telling us what to do and us saying, okay, how high do you want us to jump? You know, it should be us telling government what we want it to do. And Lydia, our constitution is the first constitution where it was written to limit the power of the federal government, not to give it uncontrollable power. Yes. And that leads to one of the other of the five ingredients is the limited powers of government. And also a third one is separation of powers. So for instance, he who has all the powers to legislate, execute the laws and judge the laws, that's so much power. And as we know, it's just human nature that as soon as you give somebody a little bit of power, it's just human nature that they want to take or or obtain or get more and more power, often at the expense of the people. And so our constitution, in order to safeguard our unalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, separates those powers among three branches of government. Okay, quick, Arch, what are those three branches of government? Well, they would be the legislative, the judicial, and the executive branch, the president, Congress, and the Supreme Court. Yep. And so we separate the powers among them. Not one group has all those powers. And so contrast that with other countries that might have just one person, like a king or a monarch, or just a few people, we'd call that an oligarchy that assumes all three of those powers and then dictates to the rest of the people which rights and powers they think the people should have. We don't want that kind of government. And that's what our constitution safeguards against having that kind of government. And then you alluded to how our constitution also limits then the powers that are given to the legislative branch, that are given to the executive branch, and that are given to the judicial branch. They just don't have unlimited powers. It's dictated in the constitution what their roles are and what powers they are to have. And then it says... Which amendment is it, Arch, that mentions that, hey, if it's not written here in the Constitution, what powers each of these three branches is supposed to have, then we deserve the the 10th. Okay, so the 10th Amendment that, I almost said 10th Commandment, that wouldn't be bad. (laughs) (laughs) That those powers not listed in the Constitution are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So, Lydia, in our history of our country, probably the best example of the separation of powers is when President Nixon was refusing to give his tapes over to Congress. And so there was a battle between the president and Congress about wanting to hear his tape recordings. And when he refused to give them over, Congress went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled nine to zero that the president must acquiesce to the wishes of Congress. 
which in turn, President Nixon turned over his tapes, which, you know, eventually he had to resign the presidency. But we see there how that separation of powers and limited powers that no one branch is more powerful than the other. I love that example. I heard an example, and I think it was by Bill Federer, a radio show that we did together. He gave the example of the judicial, executive, and legislative branches being having three kids and having one batch of brownies. And you delegate to one of the kids to cut the brownies equally. And then someone else to give out the brownies and someone else to determine whether all this is going fairly or not. And I love it because if you give each of those kids that each of those different powers, executive, judicial, and legislative, the one that's going to cut the brownies, if he knows someone else is going to choose what brownie he is going to get or she is going to get, they're going to make sure all those brownies are equal, right? Because if they don't make them equal, whoever's determining who gets each of the brownies might give them a smaller brownie and give them a bigger brownie. And we can't have that. So we got to make sure we're going to cut these equally. And then I know I just love that example of executive, legislative and judicial. Well, you lost me back when you said brownies, because now I can only picture brownies. I'm not (laughs) quite sure how much I was really paying attention to the example because, you know, brownies are a weakness. So (laughs) I thought it was a good example. Well, it's a good example. But, you know, if you're a brownie aholic, you know, you kind of (laughs) play over in that. (laughs) Our constitution gives sovereignty of our government derived from the people. We have a separation of powers, which we call checks and balances. We have limited powers in the federal government that are delegated to the state governments. And then because we are not a true democracy, we're a democratic republic, what's another one of the formulas in the Constitution? Representation. That would be the fourth of the five ingredients or elements of the United States Constitution that help us be free and have peace and prosperity. And representation, I have my own definition, but you want to do your best and define it, Arch? Well, it's each state votes and elects people from their state to represent them in the House of Representatives every two years or the Senate every six years. So we vote for these people in our states to represent us in Washington, D.C., to make these decisions, to pass these laws, to oversee our government, representing each or one of us as citizens. Right. And that's because, let's see, I'm a mom, single mom, and I have my own business, etc. I'm really busy here over where I live, but I want to still participate in our form of government, but I can't go to all these meetings in Washington, D.C. So I will elect someone then to be my voice in Washington, D.C. That's why it's important for us to really do our homework when it comes to election years and make sure that the candidates we think we want to vote for are more like-minded like we are so that we can send them into office and they can really be our own voice as if our voice is in local, state, and federal levels of government. So I love that. So this is called a republic. When you have a representative form of government, it's called a republic. And I love that. And so that's maybe- the fourth one. The big fight or discussion, hot debate during the Constitutional Convention is how each state and individual citizens are going to be represented. So what did our founders come up with as a compromise that made this representation part of the formula so successful? Wasn't it to have two branches within Congress, within the legislative branch of our government, and that is the Senate and the House, and that the Senate, each state would have equal representation in the Senate, no matter how big or how small the state, because each state was given two senators. And then keep in mind that you have really teeny weeny states who want representation, but you also have really big states who have a ton of people, and they have more people, which means more voices that need to be heard. We did a House of Representatives, which means you have as many members of the House according to your population in your state. Did I catch that right? Yes. So the House of Representatives is according to the population of each state, and each state has two senators. Right. So the upper chamber and the lower chamber, which is the House of Representatives and the Senate, 
To be a senator, the qualification for a senator and to be a rep in the House is a little bit different according to age. So that was Roger Sherman who came up with that compromise that really put the Constitutional Convention over the top. And Lydia, what I'm leading into is, if you give me a moment here, at the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, the oldest member was Benjamin Franklin. And of course, he was given preference to open up the convention. And he said at the beginning of the convention that he suggested strongly that they begin the convention asking God for wisdom. And he was poo-pooed and was asked to be quiet and they placated him. And so he sat. He didn't say another word for six more weeks. And when the convention almost broke apart, he got up to his feet again and he said, you know, If God so clothes every bird of the air, and he's concerned about every blade of grass, how much more is he concerned about the freedom of mankind? We really need to ask God for wisdom. So they dismissed for the afternoon. They all went back to their living quarters. And the next morning when they came back, they came up with and agreed to Roger Sherman's compromise, which gives us the House and the Senate and what our Constitution. So I'm leading into what is the other part of the formula that our founders put in our Constitution, believing that it was a crucial element for us to be successful as a nation. Well, the fifth of the five ingredients or elements of our constitution is a moral and a religious people. Mm. I think that is so profound because, in fact, John Adams, who is our second president of the United States of America, actually said, and I love this quote, we've all heard parts of it, but I found the whole quote, and so you're going to hear something different. So this is what he said. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Woo. Mm. I love that. Mm-hmm. So he knew and, and the founders knew that it was critical in order for freedom to prevail in this country and to succeed and survive in this country and to be promoted generation after generation. We need people who have strong moral values and moral values typically come from some kind of a religion, a faith, a belief in a higher power than just ourselves, in a strong moral code of ethics. So they knew that was key to our nation, preserving our nation's freedom. And I will say again, Lydia, that our founding fathers were very, very aware of the danger that a government would have if it had too much power and it became overwhelmingly controllable or controlling all the citizens. So they put these different formulas in there. They put different aspects of it. And it's just amazing that when we look back, our founders were actually limiting the power of the government and holding back the restraints of government and confident in the people, that we the people to be able to maintain this constitution. And as you said, our constitution is the oldest living constitution in the world. So our founders were just brilliant in what they saw, what they put in there, what they recognized as far as how we could be successful as a country. My question, Lydia, to you also is, About how many other countries in the world now have constitutions that is similar to ours? I believe it is 160 nations out of about 196 nations. 160 Mm -hmm. out of 196. What do you think? And Well, you know, it gives me chills because when the British read our constitution, they pretty much laughed and said, there is no way that you people can govern yourselves. Most of you aren't educated. You're not of the upper class. You really aren't concerned about anything but farming. And so within 15 years, you will be begging us to come back into the Commonwealth of Nations and back under the rule of the empire. Wow. 
<laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and look, because of the brilliance and the wisdom of our founding fathers, not only do we continue to have this wonderful constitution, but so many countries around the world have used our constitution as an example to be able to govern themselves in freedom. Which is amazing. It shows the power of what we have, the blessing of what we have in our United States Constitution that others would want to follow it for their own nation's constitutions. Isn't that the highest form of flattery? It Coffee? sure is, Lydia. It really is a high form of flattery. And it's just that I personally, as an historian, stand in awe of what our founding fathers were able to put together and the brilliance of it and the wisdom of it. You know, after World War II in the Pacific, our commanding officer in the Pacific was General Douglas MacArthur. And after World War II, when we went in and occupied Japan, Douglas MacArthur, Lydia, I don't know if you know this, Douglas MacArthur helped the Japanese people write a constitution. And they were so grateful that General MacArthur helped them write their constitution. And remember, we were their enemy. And he was the epitome of their enemy because he was our leader in the Pacific. They call their constitution the MacArthur Constitution. I'll be darned. That's fascinating. That, that's amazing. Yeah. That's a compliment to our founders. A wonderful story like that. And you just say, I'll be darned. I'll be darned. <laughs> well, golly. So, you know, this, this great constitution that we have, this miraculous document that we have, even some of our founders were very concerned that it was not going to work. And yet we see over time in the length of it, that this wonderful formula that you have taken apart and put back together that we stand on to have this constitutional form of government. Which I love. Something else that I love learning is that our United States Constitution allowed our country to rise from an undeveloped status to become the richest industrialized nation in the world. I had no idea that by 1905, more than half of the world's total production actually originated in the United States. Mm -hmm. And yet the United States is just 6% of the world's population back then. And it was my mom who said, and then I read it somewhere, that recorded history reveals the fact that no other country in the world has shared its wealth with other nations more than the United States. And mm -hmm. that we've often forgiven the debt owed to us by other nations. Wow, yes. that's extremely generous on our behalf. Yes, but, it is. And you think, Lydia, what we've been through, you know, particularly we've been through the Civil War. We had a total reconstruction of the net, particularly the South after the war, World War I. And then we went into a Great Depression. And President Franklin Roosevelt claimed that the United States would be the arsenal of democracy for the world during World War II. And by 1943, the United States, because of our prosperous free market enterprise system, we were producing about 85 percent of all the weaponry for all the allies fighting in World War II. Wow. It's amazing. You know, again, going back to what our founders set up and the longevity of our Constitution, and the gratitude that we have towards them because what they have given us, and then it behooves us to continue to preserve that for future generations. That's important. Very important to us. So we want to thank you for tearing it apart and giving us the different five parts of the formula. I don't want to thank you for talking about brownies because I want to go have a brownie now, which I probably should have, but that's another point. <laughs> So we want to invite everyone from age 8 to 108 to continue to listen to We the Kids and something to ponder this week. How many liberties can we expect to lose and how long can we expect to have a United States of America if we, the people, forget to follow the success formula of the United States Constitution? And how will you, your family and your community benefit or be blessed by following defending and preserving the success formula of the United States Constitution. We'd like to invite you again and everyone from 8 to 108 to listen and join We the Kids radio show, hear more forgotten American stories, and learn the principles of freedom so that we can all preserve our freedom. Gather together as a family, listen to the We the Kids radio show, and discuss the stories and principles you learn. This is how we can make a difference in our country and make a stronger America. You can purchase Forgotten American Stories Celebrating America's Constitution on the wethekids.us website. And we want to thank you for supporting We the Kids. 
we want to say happy birthday, happy 233rd birthday to our United States Constitution. And now we invite you to see what the We the Kids Liberty Players are up to. special today from the We The Kids Liberty Players. I'm introducing Daniel, who is from New Hampshire and recording from New Hampshire right now. Say hi, Daniel. Hello. And we have Christelle, my daughter, and we are on a road trip to central Washington. Christelle is the other We The Kids Liberty player, gonna be on the We The Kids segment for today's show. Say hello, Christelle. Hello. And we're in Oregon right now, going through all the smoke from all the fires that are taking place on the Pacific coast. But we want to wish you all a happy Constitution Day. And the city of Morton, Washington, is having a Constitution Day celebration week all week. And we're headed out there. Come smoke or fire or whatever comes our way, that's where we're headed to help that city, that Washington city, celebrate Constitution Day. So we're going to turn the time over to Daniel and Christelle now, who are going to ask some questions of all of us and give the answers regarding our Constitution. Take it away, Daniel. Today, we the Kids Liberty Players would like to present a special episode in honor of Constitution Day. What is the Constitution of the United States? The Constitution of the United States is a compact, which is an agreement between the states. Because the agreement was made by the several states, it was made to benefit all states. It is important to note that the several states existed before any agreement for a federal government. The Constitution is a creation of the states. Here are some random questions about the Constitution and how it is the document that defines the processes, offices, and limitations of our federal government. Is the federal government limited to those powers that are enumerated, in other words, specifically mentioned in the Constitution? Yes. Article 1, Section 8 enumerates a narrow and specific range of powers to the federal government. As James Madison wrote in Federalist Paper No. 45 during the public debate for ratification, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. The former, pertaining to the federal government, will be exercised principally on external objects such as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. Madison also says, The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives and liberties and properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. This you will find is supported by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in the Bill of Rights. Does the President take the same oath of office as the Senators and Representatives in Congress? The answer is no. Article 2 provides the exact wording of the oath to be taken. The oath reads, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Vice President, members of Congress, and all other federal office holders take an oath specified by Congress. Under the Constitution, how long do Supreme Court justices serve? There is no fixed term. Article 3, Section 1 states that justices of the Supreme Court and other federal judges shall hold their offices during periods of good behavior. Who can be impeached and in what court are they tried? Any officer of the federal government can be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors by a majority vote in the House of Representatives. Judges have a far lower bar of standards required for impeachment because they serve only for periods of good behavior, as specified in Article 3, Section 1. This means that their rulings must be consistent with the Constitution and the oath of office that they take. The House is responsible to bring a motion to impeach a federal official. Once presented, the House can vote to impeach with a simple majority. Once done, the impeachment is complete, 
but the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments and requires a two-thirds vote to remove anyone based on an impeachment and must do so under oath for that purpose. To learn more about the Constitution, please go to wethekids.us to learn more about our Constitution education programs or to start one in your own area. We the Kids can use all the help we can get in learning civics so that we can be sentinels of liberty by understanding the great constitution that our founders gave us.